Hello and welcome to Strategic News Global. The country's premier defense research organization, the DRDO or Defense Research and Development Organization, which has been spearheading all the defense related research as well as development for the end users, that is the three armed forces, is set for a revamp. What that revamp will look like and what would restructuring of DRDO involve is the topic of this week's Simply Nitin. I am Nitin Gokhale. DRDO or Defence Research and Development Organisation formed way back 66 years ago in 1958 to be precise is all set for a revamp. A committee headed by former Principal Scientific Advisor to the Prime Minister K. Vijay Raghavan and comprising people or experts from the three armed forces, uh, academia as well as uh, from uh, private defence industry in India have given a full report after talking to all stakeholders and have recommended several tectonic changes in the functioning and the uh, end objective for DRDO. If the government accepts the report in total or even if 90% of those recommendations are implemented, we are going to see a new DRDO in a different avatar from what it has been so far in the past six decades. So what are the big changes that are being envisaged? I will come to that in a moment. But why was it felt necessary that DRDO should change and DRDO needs an upgrade and a restructuring or a revamp and even maybe uh, breaking up DRDO into different functions which can be assigned to a set of people uh, nominated by the government. It was felt that the change was necessary because the DRDO uh, has been undertaking a lot of projects on behalf of uh, the armed forces or has been offering uh, the armed forces uh, several projects uh, in uh, various uh, formats like missiles and radars and uh, underwater expertise, uh, even uh, rockets, uh, ammunition, all that uh, the DRDO has been offering to the armed forces. 900 odd projects uh, the DRDO uh, does uh, or has uh, as we speak which are in various stages of development, uh, not fully completed but in various stages of development. Now the committee uh, which was constituted by the government, uh, quite high powered as I mentioned, uh, actually found out that 57% of uh, the delays and DRDO is known for its delays, you would have read several reports, several commentaries, analysis that uh, DRDO is actually a laggard, the armed forces keep complaining and the DRDO keeps uh, complaining in turn about uh, the mismatch between armed forces expectations and DRDO's delivery all that. So the committee actually went uh, into details and quantified uh, the delays and what caused the delays in these projects. So it found that 57% of the delays in DRDO projects uh, was caused by DRDO's internal problems. Either they had uh, not sufficient, they did not have sufficient expertise, uh, they did not have proper management teams or uh, the technology was not available. For whatever reasons, 57% of the projects were delayed because of DRDO's own issues, own mistakes, own problems. 17 to 18% of the uh, projects were delayed, the committee found out, because of uh, the tendency amongst the uh, users, the end users, the armed forces, of changing the specs or the specifications of the equipment that they have asked for from the DRDO. So the next biggest chunk was from uh, the armed forces or because of the armed forces mistakes. Now these delays were costing the country enormously because DRDO was not able to deliver on time or because the projects that DRDO and armed forces were working together were getting delayed beyond imagination. Some projects have gone on for 12 years, some have gone for 18 years. I am not talking about the light combat aircraft Tejas which is the example which is always cited by people 
but other smaller and significant projects. So therefore, the committee said, since this is the problem, we'll have to overcome this problem first. There are 6,700 employees in DRDO, according to the committee. 41 labs that the DRDO runs in various segments, from aero engines to, uh, to uh, uh, radars and missiles and electronics. Uh, and uh, all this is spread all over the country. But uh, the other thing which was well known amongst uh, the people who know the DRDO or work with the DRDO was uh, to the committee's uh, surprise. 50% of the R&D budget or research and development budget went to labs, DRDO labs located in Hyderabad and Bangalore, just two cities. And uh, therefore, uh, they found that there was uh, a skewed advantage to MSMEs and uh, to scientists and uh, development partners located in these two cities. It kind of became a, a kind of a cozy arrangement between uh, DRDO labs in these two cities and some of the people who work in that ecosystem. Now, uh, that uh, being the case, the committee said that this needs to change. And therefore, the functioning of the DRDO itself needs to change is what the committee has come up with. It has recommended, as you would have read in uh, some of the reports, it has recommended uh, formation of um, what it calls the Defense Technology Council to be uh, chaired or headed by Prime Minister himself. And uh, its uh, prominent members would be the National Security Advisor, the Raksha Mantri, uh, by post, not by, uh, not by name, but by the appointment. So National Security Advisor, uh, Raksha Mantri, the three chiefs of the armed forces, uh, and uh, of course the CDS. Principal Scientific Advisor, of course, in this case right now, Professor Ajay Kumar Sood, and of course, all you know all the names of the chiefs and the CDS and the, um, the defense minister or the Raksha Mantri and the NSA. They would be uh, the uh, members from the government side. They would be, in addition, representation from academia and industry uh, with two members each as uh, has been reported by uh, Indian Express, I think. But uh, even otherwise, the nine member Vijay Raghavan panel has come up with several other uh, detailed recommendations which will hopefully change the functioning and the effectiveness and the delivery uh, of uh, DRDO. And what are they? Uh, they have said that uh, the uh, second rung under the National Defense uh, Technology Council or the Defense Technology Council, there should be an executive committee which would be headed by, uh, the, uh, by the CDS or the Chief of Defense Staff and uh, the Chief of Defence Staff, uh, when he convenes the meeting of that uh, number two uh, council, uh, what uh, projects to be taken up, which can be submitted to the, uh, the apex body, then uh, the, uh, uh, the CDS, uh, the uh, meetings will be attended by the Vice Chiefs of the Armed Forces. When the meeting is convened by the Prime Minister, the Chiefs will attend, is what the arrangement has been thought about. And uh, what they have now uh, talked about is that uh, this uh, committee, the, uh, the council, will have also representation from 34 of the 41 labs of the DRDO. So these 34 labs are going to be divided into various clusters, if you want to call them, or groupings, according to the synergy between those labs. Now, uh, already the clusters exist. There is an electronic cluster, there is a uh, aero, uh, aero cluster, there is missiles cluster. Now, all of these clusters currently have director generals uh, of the uh, DRDO, senior most scientists, uh, apart from the secretary DRDO, who head these clusters. Now, these seven DGs or whatever the clusters are, uh, they will uh, actually uh, get a seat on the uh, second rung council which is headed by the CDS. They will deliberate, they will give inputs, they will give advice on what projects to carry on and how to carry on those projects. So they will be shifted upwards or uh, moved upwards into that council. The clusters themselves will be headed by the senior most director amongst those four labs. So for instance, if 
four labs make up for the aero, aero cluster, the senior most directors of one of those labs will become the chief of that cluster is what uh, the committee has recommended. And uh, therefore, uh, what they have talked about is there will be uh, the synergy that will be brought in as far as uh, these clusters are concerned. Now, uh, the other recommendations that are there uh, is for DRDO smoother functioning. Now, the smooth functioning they found out, the committee found out uh, according to uh, the, uh, the reports of the recommendations is that DRDO had stopped recruiting from colleges and uh, the universities. So, they have recommended that they should go for specific recruitment uh, uh, from colleges and, uh, and uh, universities or IITs and IIMs if necessary uh, along with uh, the way the private sector goes there. On campus interviews, on campus selection is a must because otherwise what the committee felt was that DRDO was getting the uh, people who were left behind who did not get a job or a placement in private sector would then uh, necessarily because they had no other alternative come into DRDO because they applied through uh, the usual UPSC route or a uh, separate advertisement route and therefore they came to DRDO only after exhausting the uh, options of joining the private sector. So therefore they are saying the uh, DRDO should go to the campuses and compete with private sector for talent from IITs and IIMs. Uh, the uh, scientist B which is their entry point for uh, scientists, uh, they should also come from the technical colleges instead of promoting uh, the lower rung cadre from DRDO into scientist B and then uh, hoping and expecting them to deliver uh, is something that the DRDO must not do is what the committee has said and therefore uh, it is saying that uh, you must look at the entire recruiting process even the procurement process for materials sh should be uh, different from uh, what the typical government organization does through the uh, the government uh, e-auction or GEM uh, portal that uh, is compulsory for other departments. Uh, they found, the committee members found that uh, the number of people who were sent for doing PhD or higher studies in scientific and technology courses from the DRDO has dropped significantly because uh, there is a fear of uh, losing this talent. So, what the committee has now uh, said that uh, the uh, seven uh, labs out of those 41 which are going to be left behind after 34 are made into uh, different clusters should also be opened up for testing and use by private sector. So, for instance, the integrated test range or ITR in Chandipur should be allowed to be accessed by private sector when they want to do their firing practice or they want to test their newly made missiles or whatever. Something similar will happen with Semilac is what the committee is uh, recommended that Semilac is the certification agency which gives certificate of standardization of equipment and uh, it has been uh, seen or observed that Semilac and uh, other uh, such labs delay private sector uh, participation or private sector projects willy nilly, not necessarily because of malafide and uh, because uh, the scientific uh, manpower in the DRDO is uh, less motivated because there are less opportunities or there are not enough, uh, there is not enough work which is of cutting edge. What uh, the committee is recommending is that they can hire parallelly uh, from the market, from the private sector, from the open market, PhDs and uh, postgraduates, give them specific projects and give them uh, an engagement period of 3 to 5 years. And um, after 5 years, 75 percent of those people can be allowed to go and 25 percent can be retained to remain in DRDO system. Much like the Agnivir system that has come into uh, the three armed forces for recruitment of the soldiers, where uh, 25 percent of the Agnivirs recruited will be retained after uh, assessing their performance and rest will be allowed to go out and in, back into the open market uh, as it has been done. So, similarly, uh, the final point that uh, needs to be made here is uh, many of these uh, reports which uh, I have been talking about uh, the DRDO shutting down are wrong. DRDO is not shutting down, DRDO is being restructured, DRDO is being made 
smarter or smarter use of funds uh, will be uh, allowed or will be made to be uh, done by the DRDO in the new structure uh, according to the recommendations and uh, uh, the uh, final point here that the committee has made is that uh, DRDO must keep up with uh, the modern uh, necessities of working with the armed forces. So therefore, the armed forces also need to change their outlook is what the committee has said where they can uh, work together, uh, draw up a plan together and then go only when the armed forces give a green signal rather than doing something on their own uh, or starting to develop some platform or equipment on their own and then going to the armed forces saying that we have this uh, is has to change. So basically the point that is being made was that uh, there should be more coordination, there should be uh, more research and development rather than uh, uh, production uh, or productionization of those uh, research uh, equipment that is being done by the DRDO is what uh, the committee has recommended. There is of course a word of caution that uh, you cannot write off DRDO straight away because some of the uh, projects which are in national interest which are secret like the ASAT test that was done by the DRDO or the missiles program has to remain uh, in control of the government through the DRDO and therefore uh, not everything that the committee may have recommended for the benefit of the private sector and benefit of the uh, of the country uh, is necessarily right is what uh, people who have scrutinized uh, the report and who have uh, taken a look at the recommendations have said and therefore that must be brought in that word of caution that not everything is wrong with the RDO but it needs to be smarter it needs to be modern it needs to look at the future rather than continue uh, business as usual at, as it has been doing for the last so many years now and therefore uh, it's a good uh, I would say uh, middle way that has been found where you are not killing the DRDO, you are not uh, throwing them to the wolves uh, like the OFB, the Ordnance Factory Board which has been corporatized. There is no corporatization here, DRDO will continue to get its budget from the government or the funds from the government. but it needs to spend that budget or the fund smartly rather than uh, letting it drift where uh, results are uh, or the delivery is uh, not up commensurate with uh, what has been promised right at the beginning of that project. That is I think the key as far as uh, the uh, recommendations of the committee are concerned and therefore it is a good first step in bringing the Indian defence sector uh, into a position where it can deliver, it can uh, pro uh, plan, project and uh, finally uh, co-produce with the Indian defence uh, private sector industry. That is what uh, the committee has uh, actually said. Let us see how it pans out, uh, whether the government will adopt the report or the recommendations immediately, whether it will wait for some more consultations. But overall I think it is a good step and therefore I thought I will flag this for you. Uh, this is something that we must watch out for, uh, your feedback is always welcome, your uh, comments are uh, something that I uh, cherish because uh, then I can bring in more new, I mean fresher subjects, new subjects or even improve on what we say. Of course you can watch uh, some of the uh, interviews that I had done with the previous uh, chief of DRDO Dr. Satish Reddy where he had spoken about a uh, number of projects that the DRDO has done, how uh, research goes on, how it has been a successful uh, mission mode project as far as missiles are concerned. And uh, the current DRDO chief Samir Kamath, Dr. Samir Kamath had spoken in at our conclave catalyst in October 2023 where he spoke about what the DRDO is trying to do after the Prime Minister had told them uh, what he expects from DRDO. So, young scientist lab, uh, labs were uh, formed or established where uh, people below 35 years uh, are undertaking research, maybe cutting edge research. So, do watch those videos also. But uh, this program was concentrating mainly on the recommendations of the K. Vijay Raghavan committee which has uh, gone into what possible restructuring and uh, revamp of the DRDO can be done. That's all I have this week. Uh, do keep watching Strat News Global and of course Simply Nitin every Saturday at 7 pm. I uh, will come back to you with more uh, 
uh, other uh, programs and other informative uh, details that I can get on the Indian Armed Forces or the national security setup uh, that India has, which is undergoing a major transformation in various ways. For the time being, it's goodbye. Hello and welcome to Strat News Global. This week, Simply Nitin is coming to you from Bangalore. In fact, from a facility of the Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, which manufactures the Tejas Mark 1A aircraft. As you can see, I'm standing next to uh, almost finished and uh, yet to be certified Tejas Mark 1A, uh, which is uh, going to be uh, flying and uh, after final testing and uh, otherwise will get inducted into the Indian Air Force. Behind me there is the G404 engine, which uh, powers the LCA Mark 1A. And uh, of course, this is the final uh, assembly line of Mark 1A. Now, uh, why am I doing this from here? Because I wanted to do this episode on HAL which is on a resurgence mode over the past two, three or four years. In fact, uh, the market, share market uh, reflects uh, the confidence in HAL because its market cap has uh, gone beyond uh, 2 trillion uh, mark as far as uh, the uh, market cap of uh, HAL is concerned. Its shares have surged uh, some 127% uh, over the past uh, one year or so. And that is because it is performing extremely well uh, in terms of uh, a range of products it has in its portfolio. From uh, aircraft and helicopters to aero engines and uh, avionics and accessories. And of course, uh, continuing with its upgrade of Sukhoi 30, uh, the uh, government is also backing HAL extremely well. In fact, the uh, last uh, DAC or Defense Acquisition Council uh, had uh, sanctioned uh, some of the projects for HAL and uh, the contract that was awarded to HAL, uh, one of the biggest contracts in recent times of uh, nearly 8,074 crores uh, for acquisition of 34 advanced light uh, helicopters or ALH Dhruv Mark III for Indian Army as well as the Indian Coast Guard, which shows how uh, HAL has progressed over the years uh, from starting with uh, ALH Mark 1 to now Mark 3 to be manufactured by HL and to be inducted by Indian uh, Coast Guard and uh, the Indian Army. And of course, as uh, all of you are aware, the LCA Mark 1A, uh, which is uh, under production, the government has also sanctioned uh, the uh, production and manufacturing of LCA Mark 2. Uh, and I was here to interview uh, the chairman and managing director of HAL CB Anand Krishnan. Uh, of course, we'll bring that interview to you in our sister channel, uh, Bharat Shakti, where we have a new series uh, which is uh, being, uh, which has started called On the Shop Floor. And uh, there, of course, he elaborates on the detailed planning and the roadmap that HAL has over the, uh, over the next decade. Uh, of course, the highlights of that conversation is what something I wanted to share. And uh, that is uh, how HAL is now planning from Mark 1A of Tejas to uh, Mark 2 uh, towards uh, the end of the decade, uh, you can say two years before end of the decade in 2028-29. Prototype should come out according to him for uh, Mark 2 in uh, December 25, December 2025 or December, uh, early January 2026, which itself is a, is a good thing for uh, the Indian Air Force to happen. Because uh, remember, the CCS has also given clearance for the advanced medium combat aircraft, uh, which uh, will of course uh, be, uh, which has been conceptualized and which will uh, then get into the design and the uh, development uh, and the manufacturing will of course come to HAL. But that's uh, almost a decade down the line. Uh, we still don't know what engine will be used for AMCA. But the fact is uh, that LCA Mark 1A experience and Mark 2 experience uh, in the next four or five years will stand in good stead uh, to uh, the HAL for accelerating the program for AMCA whenever it uh, fructifies uh, going forward. The other thing that has happened is HAL's uh, helicopter facility uh, is or helicopter portfolio is giving uh, the 
HAL, it's uh, one of its largest portfolios and largest um, boost because it, it has a range of products as the uh, chairman and managing director was explaining. From ALH, there is LCH, uh, the light combat helicopter, uh, Prachand, there is uh, the uh, armed version of the ALH uh, which is Rudra uh, and uh, of course uh, the uh, light utility helicopter which is going to replace the Cheetah and Chetak is going to be uh, one of the strong points of HAL. It's also got the engine uh, facilities or engine upgrades contract uh, HAL has got and more importantly HAL is actually now keeping up with uh, the requirements of uh, modern technology, getting fresh recruitments done, uh, some of their experienced engineers are passing on their knowledge to the new recruits so that there is continuity and the expertise is not lost. And uh, similarly, uh, the vendor development program or how uh, private sector is now uh, coming up and uh, supporting the LCA project uh, can be seen here in this uh, beautifully illustrated uh, chart here. Uh, it talks about the LCA development and national integrator. It, uh, the 144 agencies which it talks about is, uh, are spread all over India. The map itself is illustrative. The particulars of LCA can, uh, can be seen here. And the amount of integration, coordination, uh, amount of uh, expertise that is required is actually captured in this, uh, in this uh, entire uh, chart or you can say uh, the board here. A number of parts, if you see, uh, people don't realize in the common, uh, common citizens or even uh, uh, some of us don't understand how many parts go in to make a uh, fighter aircraft. Uh, if you look at this, uh, they are talking about number of parts required to build LCA is 14,837. Who would have thought? I mean, of course, you see the finished product and think, oh, well, it's, it's built and it's uh, out and it's going to fly. But 14,837 parts, tools required to build a LCA as it shows here is more than 11,000. And uh, of course, uh, all the machinery, all the structural assemblies, equipping, coupling, which means you require all kinds of expertise in building an aircraft. I, in fact, asked the CMD that till some years ago, uh, critics of LCA used to say uh, that uh, it's a good aircraft, but not yet a good fighter. He said, well, that stage is past. Uh, we are now at a stage where it is also a good fighter. Avionics have been upgraded. The uh, hard points, they have eight hard points in LCA where uh, load carrying capacity in Mark 1A has also uh, been enhanced. And uh, the Air Force, uh, which already has uh, a squadron in Sulur, uh, will be using uh, LCA on the northern borders very soon is what uh, Air Force sources tell me. Which means there is a confidence that has been built uh, into the system, into LCA's performance. Uh, and the Air Force is happy to do it because ultimately uh, the strength of a nation is built on self-reliance and defense. If you are dependent on others for uh, uh, imports and other manufacturers and other uh, companies uh, abroad, there is always a likelihood of being squeezed or by, uh, controlled by those people, uh, the supply chains and otherwise. So LCA is an extremely important program. Uh, I was told that the Prime Minister was here in this hangar when he flew the LCA and of course came and uh, encouraged people. So everybody here tells me that that has uh, acted as a morale booster because uh, LCA has been demonized, LCA has been criticized uh, quite vehemently by a lot of people. But I think uh, it has gone past all that, uh, all those hurdles and it's on its way to becoming uh, one of uh, the leading fighters uh, in the world uh, in the next decade or so. Uh, the CMD was also telling me that how there is interest in at least three or four countries. Uh, some discussions are in advanced stage uh, for exports of LCA. And of course, uh, the, the fact that uh, LCA uh, has uh, now flown abroad a couple of times uh, to various air shows uh, tells us that there is a lot of interest in this. Uh, going forward, uh, how the Mark II develops and how uh, it replaces the depleting strength of the uh, Air Force in terms of MiGs and uh, their uh, uh, you know, outgoing squadrons will be important. Uh, the, the fact is that uh, once LCA comes in, Air Force will also have the uh, numbers that it requires to remain um, 
a force uh, enabler and a force uh, to reckon with as far as the Indian subcontinent is concerned. Therefore, it was important for me to come and see. Uh, you will see it in a larger uh, program as I mentioned. But here uh, in this episode of Simply Nitin, I just wanted to uh, tell you where uh, HAL is headed. It's got uh, excellent set of uh, tier 1 and tier 2 and tier 3 suppliers and um, supporting uh, 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 ecosystem as far as uh, these uh, aircraft are concerned. And um, all that one can say standing here as a last remark in this program is that L HAL is poised for far bigger leap than it has ever done, although it has served the country for more than six decades very well. But today it is poised to become a much more valued uh, enterprise, a Navratna, if you want to call it, as far as Indian government is concerned, Indian nation is concerned. That's all I have this week. Uh, I'm sure you'll have lots of questions on uh, where uh, the program is headed, many details, uh, many um, things have not been said in this. But wait for that interview to be aired. You will get many of those answers that you are looking for. For the time being, it's goodbye. Hello and welcome to Strat News Global. Earlier this week, the Cabinet Committee on Security cleared uh, one of the most awaited military programs, the development and design as well as manufacturing of an advanced medium combat jet for the Indian Air Force. Sanctioned on 7th of March, what will AMCA, as it is called uh, in an abbreviated form, bring to the table as far as the Indian Air Force and its strength is concerned, is something that I am going to try and attempt to unravel or simplify in this episode of Simply Nitin. I am Nitin Gokhale. So the quest for India's advanced combat jet has been on for almost a decade plus where India had anticipated that once it acquires uh, the uh, jets from uh, the program called the MMRCA or the multi-role, uh, medium multi-role combat aircraft that were supposed to be acquired from one of the big OEMs, uh, original equipment manufacturers. Of course, India ended up uh, buying only 36 Rafales from France in 2015-16 uh, and they have of course been inducted into the Indian Air Force relatively strengthening its combat fleet uh, strength really. But apart from what India is doing indigenously, it also needs uh, a futuristic aircraft, almost a fifth generation or a 4.5 plus generation aircraft. And that's why AMCA was planned, AMCA was conceptualized. Of course, uh, design flaws were there, there were a lot of to and fro about the design. But finally, that quest seems to have got off the ground because the Cabinet Committee on Security, as I mentioned, has uh, already um, sanctioned the program. It's a long-term program, almost 10 to 15 years of gestation period. But we will get there a little later. But what is a medium combat jet? Now, there are uh, light combat jets or light combat aircraft like uh, India's own Tejas Mark 1, I, Mark 1A, I which is under production right now. Uh, according to some of the definition in military aviation, as understood in India primarily, the uh, definition of a medium combat jet or a light combat jet depends on the weight and size of the jet. So fighters in this category are about uh, 20 to 25 tons uh, to be called medium jets or medium combat jets. Uh, MiG-21s, uh, which were the mainstay of uh, Indian Air Force for a long time, from the uh, uh, mid 60s till uh, very recently used to be about 16 to 18 tons not completely light not completely medium the mig 29s uh, had heavier uh, weight than mig 21s of course the rafale which is the latest induction in the indian air force is about 24 tons uh, and uh, the su 30s are the heaviest aircraft combat jets that indian air force has and they weigh about 32, between 30 and 38 tons depending on what kind of payload, what kind of weaponry uh, they are carrying as far as uh, the uh, flying conditions are concerned. Light combat aircraft Tejas uh, in all its variants, Mark, 1, Mark 1A and uh, 
they are about 7 to 9 tons, very light, very maneuverable, but the numbers are larger when it comes to induction. The AMCA or the Advanced Medium Combat Aircraft will be uh, almost equivalent to Rafale, 24 tons, 24 to 25 tons is what the plan is. And therefore, it is called the Medium Combat Jet. That is only about the uh, weight itself and the Aeronautical Development Agency which is entrusted with design and development of AMCA in conjunction with of course the Indian Air Force and um, HAL as the manufacturer or the Hindustan Aeronautics Limited as the manufacturer has described AMCA as a medium weight multi-role fifth generation aircraft. We will come to that why it is advanced than the current aircraft in Indian Air Force's inventory and why uh, it will be a game changer a decade or decade and a half down the line. It will be different from the current lot of aircraft that Indian Air Force operates variously because uh, many people have called it and mistakenly as uh, Indian Air Force uh, officers and Indian Air Force uh, people who handle the project say it is not exactly fully stealth. It can be called low observable platform in all respects and when I say all respects it will have reduced uh, RCS, uh, of course reduced uh, infrared signature and oral that is the audio signature of uh, the aircraft will be much reduced because of various techniques, various uh, designs that it will have. And why will it be? It is not fully st uh, stealth because its exhaust or its engine is not shielded by uh, the uh, advanced material which uh, sort of creates the uh, non uh, stealth uh, and uh, creates the stealth effect as far as the uh, aircraft is concerned. In the world today, as of now, only uh, the F-22 uh, and the B-2 of uh, in the US Air Force and possibly, I mean now this is again a matter of debate, Su-57, uh, the Russians claim to be uh, truly stealth but there is a uh, school of thought that it is not fully stealth because it does not have the exhaust uh, shielded by stealth material. Nevertheless, uh, the US is uh, way ahead of the other countries. Uh, the Chinese might claim uh, their J JF-20 uh, may be stealth but we are not getting there because we do not know uh, how much authentic information comes out from China. AMCA's airframe and uh, the shape of the airframe and the facets of the airframe and the use of uh, radar absorbent materials or RAM will actually make uh, detection difficult and that is what uh, every air force wants. It wants little more time uh, to uh, come out of a combat before being detected. Now, uh, the low observable platform uh, when we talk about it is that extra time that the aircraft will get. It is anyway stealth. Uh, is a, uh, not a panacea as uh, military aviators will tell you that it can no aircraft can be fully uh, invisible or uh, unobservable. So, the idea is to reduce or increase time before it is detected, the, uh, the, the time lapse between being detected and coming out of that combat zone is what will make uh, AMCA uh, truly uh, game changer as far as Indian Air Force is concerned because they are now looking at its design and its shape to be uh, sort of covered by the, rad uh, the radar absorbent materials and also the aerodynamics of the airframe is designed in such a way that radar waves will slip off and not uh, reflect back to the radar itself but will uh, get deflected somewhere else. So, th those are technical terms and technical issues that have been tackled by the designers and developers of AMCA. But, uh, it brings many more features and therefore, I am asking this question and trying to uh, answer those uh, that question. What is so advanced in the advanced medium combat aircraft that India is now designing? It will have uh, enhanced sensor fusion platforms. I mean the platform itself will be fully sensor fused. That means, on one place, in one place, in one um, dashboard, all your sensors will be fused they will uh, work faster, they will respond faster, uh, unlike uh, in the fourth generation or a four and a half generation aircraft. Uh, the work material will be much more advanced uh, than it has been in any of the aircraft. 
because of uh, the uh, availability of uh, different uh, communication technology, different uh, sensor technology, different observation technology. So, the advanced communication systems that will be uh, inducted or uh, placed on the uh, AMCA will uh, allow a low probability of interception of communication. Because if you have everything else which is near stealth, but your communication is open to be, to be interpreted, then there is no use of an uh, advanced combat jet. Therefore, this, is, this aspect is being given a lot of attention in the AMCA itself. Similarly, the mission computer on the aircraft will have edge computing capability, uh, which will mean that uh, the pilots will uh, have uh, faster uh, availability of situational awareness in the, in the sky during combat or otherwise and uh, the uh, decision making will be much faster because it is all available in a split second uh, because of the uh, high performance uh, mission computer that will be uh, installed on board AMCA. Similarly, uh, that means, that really means is uh, the pilot does not have to look at three or four inputs on uh, radar, your own radar, your missiles, your incoming aircraft, nothing, everything will be uh, computed by the mission computer which is uh, way faster than what is available today, which will be way faster than what, what is available today and therefore, the distillation of that information of various inputs will give one concrete or comprehensive picture to the pilots and therefore, uh, they will have uh, faster decision making ability is what uh, the designers are hoping. Um, and the greatest feature which uh, perhaps allows uh, AMCA to be called a real advanced jet is that unlike uh, the current combat jets or fighter jets, it has the design uh, element which can be scaled up or upgraded. So, it is um, uh, you can call it the building blocks are there uh, having done uh, Mark 1, AMCA Mark 1 in the first phase the uh, Mark II with another engine can be uh, also developed and designed and manufactured is what the uh, makers and, and the, uh, the system engineers are telling uh, the government and therefore, that makes AMCA a real advanced jet going forward whenever it is uh, implemented or whenever it uh, sees the light of day. The uh, ADA of course, will uh, develop uh, the five uh, initial prototypes which, which could be called AMCA Mark I. Uh, the cost of the project sanctioned by the CCS uh, today is just about uh, INR or Indian rupees 15,000 crores, but they have been told the Air Force and ADA and uh, the HAL everybody has been told that whenever more money is required, it is it will be made available by the government. So, on that front at least there is no worry uh, as far as MCA's development, faster development is concerned. Uh, it, the actual production by HAL, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited may not become, may not begin at least a, a decade from now uh, before it is fully developed, but we will have to wait and watch how it goes because the tight deadlines sometimes uh, have been described as the AMCA has been delayed and it will uh, have real problems, but because of the past 30 years of experience on the light combat aircraft. Mark 1, Mark 1A and in the next few years Mark 2. This Mark 2, LCA Mark 2 is going to work as a transition platform between LCA Mark 1 variant, all the variants that LCA Mark 1 has and AMCA, which what, what does it mean? It means all the designers, engineers, users, tier 1 and tier 2 suppliers have learned lessons from their experiment and their uh, building the LCA Mark 1A or Mark 1 uh, and then uh, subsequently Mark 2. That will reduce the uh, timelines considerably because the experience that they have gained there, those mistakes that were made during LCA's uh, building or LCA's manufacturing will not be repeated during AMCA and therefore, the timelines can be squeezed and tighter timelines and deadlines can be met. Currently, uh, the AMCA is going to be run on the 90 kilonewton G F414 engine. It is designed based on that engine, but the Mark II or the next upgraded AMCA, uh, its engine is uh, decision is up in the air. Uh, the Mark II aspires to have a 100 kilonewton, 110 kilonewton engine, which uh, still does not exist in the world, 
uh, in that sense and therefore uh, for making that uh, 110 kilonewton engine there are three competitors Safran from France, G uh, from US which is of course this uh, supplying the F414 engine and Rolls Royce from UK are competing uh, to make an engine jointly and India is determined to have a joint IP or a uh, you know engine which has the intellectual property right with India so that it doesn't have to depend on any other country going forward. That's the plan. How will it benefit Indian aviation sector? Of course uh, the spin-offs are huge because the kind of technology that is going to be inducted on the AMCA uh, it will have uh, spin-offs for both defense and civilian sectors in terms of uh, the equipment used, the radars, the avionics, the, uh, the, the sensors and of course uh, the materials, advanced materials that are being used. LCA's journey in that way uh, is actually coming to fruition now. The kind of uh, tortuous journey that LCA had is actually uh, allowed designers and uh, developers, industry and the Indian Air Force to learn from those mistakes and not repeat those mistakes so that the experience has been distilled into something which is concrete and which can be improved upon and developed uh, further when the MK is being built. So as I said lessons distilled over a quarter century and more will actually allow India to leapfrog from MK Mark 1 or AMCA to the sixth generation fighter maybe uh, 20 years down the line in the future because spiral development has been only uh, possible uh, way to develop uh, effective fighter jets or even jets uh, in the world. Any other country, only three countries have what is called low observable uh, fighter jets or what popularly has been known as stealth fighter jets or the ability to have uh, the medium combat stealth fighter jets, US, China and Russia. And uh, once India gets there, uh, it has the ability, as I said, to upgrade itself. AI, artificial intelligence will play a big part in the next decade where uh, machine computing uh, and also uh, the uh, efficiency and the technology will be so good that sometimes some of the aircraft can be unmanned and therefore the pilots will have a huge help and the uh, Air Force is looking at something called MUMT. Now I was very surprised when somebody used that term so I asked for an explanation or at least elaboration of that uh, term. And I am told it's called man unmanned teams. That means some aircraft can be manned of course with two pilots like the AMCA and some aircraft uh, which can be unmanned and can work in tandem uh, for a mission, for a particular mission. Sometimes only the unmanned will go ahead and the manned will follow. Sometimes they will combine their strengths and abilities together. And of course uh, the model to be considered for future warfare is what the Air Force is looking at. So AMCA eventually and my final point here is has to be treated like a national strategic project where all of government approach, uh, all of industry approach, all of uh, Air Force approach has to come in where everyone combines their strengths, combines their vision, combines their skills, capability, adaptability into making this a successful project because the spin-offs like I have said are huge and if India can get this right over the next 10 to 15 years then it comes into the League of Nations which very few of them can produce a combat jet worth calling fifth generation which again will lead to the sixth generation and therefore the AMCA deserves all the backing it has. It is not delayed if you have heard from different people that it is a delayed project. Unlike LCA, AMCA is on track because as I said I explained that the learning experience has meant the timelines can be squeezed. So let's hope and let's back it as people, as citizens that the AMCA will be truly a national project and a project that will change the face of Indian aviation which was so far dependent on imports and borrowed technology. That being said, I think uh, the Indian Air Force needs faster induction of uh, fighter jets. It's got all other platforms uh, well in place but the fighter jets are a worry, depleting strengths of fighter jets. MCA will of course come as I said after 15 years or so uh, to really be effective and to be called uh, an Indian Air Force uh, fighter. But till then let's hope this project takes off and uh, whatever one can do to support it, we all must do it. 
that's all I have this week. I thought this is a very topical subject and all of you will be interested. Therefore, this I am not a uh, aviation expert. I am not a military aviation uh, expert either. So, therefore, if some of these uh, details have come, they have come from uh, talking to different people. They have given those things. Maybe I didn't understand many of it. But do uh, take the overall uh, picture of what I have uh, presented to you. And of course, keep sending your feedback and your comments. They are very essential to us to learn and uh, improve. And of course, your um, social media subscription to our handles and our YouTube channel is also important. So keep us going by supporting us. And of course, we will bring you more and more such informative, at least uh, information derived from experts episodes on Simply Nitin, which comes to you every Saturday. Until the next time, it's goodbye. Hello and welcome. In the country, you may very often hear about several paramilitary forces that the center has and sometimes helps states in deploying them during crises and uh, during uh, natural uh, calamities or even uh, law and order situations. But believe me, there is only one real paramilitary force in India and that is called the Assam Rifles which was established way back in 1835. What is its history? And as it completes 190 years this month, I thought I'll flag some of the highlights and achievements of this old force, which still serves India's Northeast with its efficiency and effectiveness. I'm Nitin Gokhale and you are on Simply Nitin. So what is Assam Rifles? It is a paramilitary force as I mentioned. And what is the definition of a paramilitary force? It is a police force or a force that is officered by the Indian Army officers. Now, none of the other central paramilitary forces or central police organizations as they are called like CISF, CRPF, BSF, SSB, none of them are officered by the officers on deputation from the Indian Army. That distinguishes the Assam Rifles from rest of these CPMFs, Central Paramilitary Forces, as they are called. The only thing common between the Assam Rifles and the CPMFs are the two facts that uh, the Assam Rifles administratively comes under the Ministry of Home Affairs or the MHA. And like the other police, central police forces is given the budget or is allocated the budget from the Ministry of Home Affairs and not the Ministry of Defense. Although the Indian Army officers uh, lead uh, those uh, battalions of uh, Assam Rifles, the fact is that the budget comes from uh, the Ministry of Home Affairs. But the operational control of the Assam Rifles in the Northeast and elsewhere, wherever it goes, wherever it is deployed sometimes, is under the Indian Army. Now, we have to understand this distinction, but that is not the uh, main thrust of this episode. The main thrust is that Assam Rifles was established not in the name of Assam Rifles, but as Kachar Levi in 1835, way back in 1835 in Assam, the undivided Assam, basically to uh, act as a force to defend uh, the commercial interest of the British who had established uh, the tea industry or about to establish or was a fledgling tea industry in the 1830s. Tea industry uh, began in India's northeast or in Assam in 1832. And uh, the tea uh, industrialist and tea garden workers were, came under frequent attacks from bandits, from tribals, from uh, the dacoits uh, in those areas and they needed a force, essentially a militia. A ragtag militia was raised in 1835 under the name Kachar Levi. And uh, then of course, uh, it kept on having different forms of identity. Uh, in 1862, it became the frontier force controlled by the government uh, or the British government that time. In 1917, uh, in the middle of the Second World War, the Frontier Force was converted to Assam Rifles with just 
uh, four battalions. Uh, that, that force strength continued till 1940 when the Second World War began. And uh, then of course it has expanded. So the Assam Rifles now has expanded to have 46 battalions or nearly 65,000 uh, troops under its command, uh, which is uh, almost equivalent to a core in the Indian Army. Uh, the Again, the distinguishing factor as far as the Assam Rifles is concerned, as I said, the officers come from the Indian Army, from various arms of the Indian Army, they get uh, deputed to lead the battalions. Uh, the Director General of the Assam Rifles is a three-star Lieutenant General from the Indian Army. And so are the staff officers in the headquarters. They are also from the Indian Army. But the Jawans and the JCOs come from mostly from the Northeast, the seven or eight states of the Northeast, seven sisters and one brother, uh, which is Sikkim, as we colloquially know it in, uh, in the Northeast. They are recruited from amongst the local population, various tribes in the Northeast. And therefore, they get mixed in these battalions when the recruitment happens and they get trained together. They have different languages. There's common lingua uh, franca is uh, the common language is uh, basically uh, broken Assamese, broken Bengali, broken Nagamese, which is again a mixture of Bengali, Assamese, Hindi, English, that kind of thing. So it's got a long history. It's grown roots in the Northeast. And uh, basically, they are uh, the uh, protectors of the Northeast. They come from their sons of the soil. Uh, they also uh, know the area, the topography, they know the social fabric of the Northeast and therefore Assam Rifles says most of the time, uh, bulk of the force has remained in the Northeast. So it started off, as I said, uh, by for being Kachar Levy and then uh, turned into Assam Rifles in 1917. The first Indian officer to become the head of Assam Rifles was Colonel uh, Sidhiman Rai who was a colonel and he was designated as the Inspector General of Police for Assam Rifles uh, in 1948. Then of course, uh, the Assam Rifles has got deployed at various other theatres like Sri Lanka uh, during the IPKF campaign, the Indian Peacekeeping Force campaign between 1987 and 1990 in Sri Lanka. Uh, it has uh, got one battalion on the um, LAC, the Line of Actual Control or the Indo-Tibet border in Sikkim. Uh, it has also uh, deployed and worked and has uh, carried out operations in Jammu and Kashmir. So it's got a uh, long legacy, a very rich legacy of uh, achievements. But more than anything else, it has a reassuring presence in the Northeast. And I can relate to you one incident uh, which happened with me. Way back in 1992, I uh, happened to travel from Guwahati to a place called Noklak, uh, which is on the... Uh, Myanmar border, the Burma border as, as it used to be called. And uh, there was a refugee crisis. Some people from uh, Myanmar, had, Myanmar's western provinces had uh, migrated or ha had fled, had come as refugees into uh, the Noklak, uh, Noklak uh, subdivision or the Noklak village, which is on the border with uh, Myanmar in Nagaland. So we traveled for two days to get there on a bus from uh, finally from Tioen Sang and uh, once we reached there, me and another colleague uh, was working for Times of India at that time. When we reached there, uh, we of course met those refugees, uh, we met uh, some of the local people, asked them why they have come, what is the crisis on the other side and all that. And then we went back to the bus station to uh, take the bus back to Tioen Sang or so we thought. But it turned out that the bus wouldn't go for the next two days back to Tiyonsang. It was a bus that would operate every second day between uh, Noklak and Tiyonsang, which will travel for about two hours one way, but the bus won't go back. So we then were at a loss where to stay, what to do. So somebody told us, one of the villagers told us in broken Hindi, that there is an Assam Rifles post, uh, why don't you just try your luck there. There was nothing else there, no administrative office, no administrative uh, uh, police station. So we walked across uh, completely at a loss what to do and uh, just went and requested the uh, company commander as it is called. It's a small uh, post and there was a company of course deployed further up the, uh, the border and we said that we are stranded, we don't know what to do. So they were very welcoming, they hosted us for the next two days, next 48 hours 
and we learned so much of it uh, from so much about the local history traditions culture and the way the assam rifles operates uh, with uh, the locals and for the locals in that uh, 48 hours stay there so they are everywhere uh, you uh, name it um, like you know there is to be an old saying in uh, the northeast jahan na jaye belgadi wahan jaye marwadi because traders went first in those areas but i i can say it with confidence that jahan na jaye belgadi wahan jaye assam rifles because there are places like vijayanagar where are still only air connected only an assam rifles post continues to fly the indian flag there we have done that episode uh, twice in fact in the last 3 years on vijayanagar what it means to india and why it is important for india and why assam rifles is there i did that in september 2021 the link of that video will be available uh, in the descriptor and my colleague amitabh revi actually did an interview with the current dg of assam rifles ref general pc nair in vijayanagar uh, again the connectivity is only by air so assam rifles is everywhere in the far flung areas it has come a long way uh, it is going to complete 190 years on 24th of march and we hope to bring you a special feature uh, about uh, the force uh, in our sister channel the bharat shakti youtube channel uh, that's the plan but uh, assam rifles is uh, truly the friend of the hill people or the uh, friend of the people in the northeast it is actually called the sentinels of the northeast was called at one point in time and there are several uh, incidents in which assam rifles has been a historic witness i'll just mention two an assam rifles company or assam rifles force accompanied major bob khating to tawang to uh, establish india's sovereignty over tawang in 1951 it was because of assam rifles that major bob khating then by then a civilian officer uh, who uh, actually took this force and established india's control over tawang which had the buddhist which has the buddhist monastery and which now is the major point of dispute between india and china as all of you are aware the second was again uh, connected to tibet when uh, the current dalai lama uh, the old gentleman that you see who is a revered uh, buddhist guru buddhist uh, revered figure uh, religious and uh, spiritual figure when he fled the potala palace in uh, lhasa and uh, traveled through the inhospitable terrain of uh, tibet to uh, enter india or enter nefa then nefa northeast frontier agency Uh, he was escorted from the uh, border point of Kinzamane in Arunachal Pradesh now Arunachal Pradesh then Nefa to uh, Tejpur by uh, elements or troops and leaders of uh, five assam rifles battalion which was uh, then uh, guarding the uh, borders in fact in the 1962 war assam rifles had different posts right ahead of the indian army right on the what is called the macmahon line in in the northeast and it has served uh, the country very well several awards have been won those list that list is available you can see that but uh, the fact is assam rifles is completely uh, inseparable from the northeast and that force deserves all the accolades it can get it has of course come under some flag because of political reasons re- in the recent manipur um, uh, situation uh, disturbed situation in manipur where uh, some of the communities have accused them of taking sides with another community uh, but uh, that is par for course as far as northeast is concerned it also has the responsibility of guarding the indo myanmar border right now and in fact uh, when the fence comes up as the government has already declared then the assam rifles like the bsf in punjab and rajasthan and on the bangladesh border the assam rifles will be responsible for the uh, for guarding uh, the indo myanmar border once uh, even without the fence it is guarding it once the fun- fence comes up it will have more responsibility it of course prevents drugs uh, tries to prevent drug smuggling uh, you know uh, narcotics uh, coming in from uh, east of uh, in india's northeast that is from the myanmar golden triangle it uh, catches and uh, captures and captures uh, smugglers contraband uh, carriers but the fact is without assam rifles northeast will not be the same in fact uh, many of the uh, government policies uh, have been first uh, tried out or front ended by the assam rifles in the northeast and therefore uh, i thought i'll give you this uh, brief history or a brief glimpse into assam rifles what it does uh, what it means uh, for security and 
protection of the India's northeast, which is a crucial uh, part of India as far as the security dynamics is concerned. And therefore, uh, it deserves what it gets, the accolades it gets, the budget that it gets, and it is likely to be expanded further according to uh, the plans that the Assam Rifles and the MHA has. So, uh, do keep uh, watching whenever you travel in the Northeast for an Assam Rifles post. They will certainly be uh, welcoming you with a cup of tea and uh, warm smiles and very welcoming nature. Whenever you go, wherever you go, uh, it, any remote destination in the Northeast. If you travel there, do look out for an Assam Rifles post. It will always be welcoming. That's all I have this week. Do keep watching Strat News Global and of course, keep sending your feedback. Uh, it's extremely important for us. And uh, our social media handles are visible to you on the screen. Uh, of course, we also bring you reports from the ground. As I said, we have uh, done reports on Assam Rifles earlier. But this is the whole history of Assam Rifles. I thought I'll encapsulate in these 15-20 minutes. I hope you enjoy that. But for the time being, it's goodbye. Five years ago this week, India struck a terrorist camp in mainland Pakistan at Balakot, followed by a Pakistani operation which claimed a counter-strike or a retaliatory strike on an Indian military installation in Jammu and Kashmir, leading to a large amount of anxiety across the world about a possible escalation between the two sides. But that didn't happen. And why it didn't happen and what are the lessons learned from that strike on Balakot terrorist camp by Indian Air Force planes is the subject of this week's Simply Nitin. I'm Nitin Gokhale. So all of you are familiar with the uh, events of February 2019. First, the Pulwama terrorist attack in which 40 plus Central Reserve Police Force or CRPF Jawans were uh, killed in that bomb uh, or a suicide bomb attack uh, by a lone uh, terrorist uh, who was a, a young man who was indoctrinated and motivated to carry out that attack. Following that, uh, there was outrage, anger in India and uh, the thinking in Indian public's mind at that point in time was that there will be retaliation from India given the fact that in 2016 when a similar attack in Uri had killed some 18 Indian army jawans, India had carried out a cross-border land operation inside Pakistan occupied Kashmir. But clearly the decision makers in India knew that if they carried out or repeated the same land attack or a uh, what they call the uh, surgical strike that time. Uh, it would be uh, futile because Pakistan would have taken precautions to avoid or to prevent such an attack from India. So the only other option was uh, to bomb one of the uh, facilities of the jaish e mohammed headquarters uh, in mainland Pakistan or one of its camps. And uh, of course now we know after five years or even uh, at that time on 26th of February uh, a package of uh, uh, 12 Mirage 2000 uh, Indian Air Force planes crossed the line of control and released their standoff weapons to uh, attack Balakot in the Khyber Pakhtunwa province, killing unspecified number of terrorists in uh, that attack, uh, which of course Pakistan denied and said nobody was killed, only a crow and a tree was damaged, uh, was Pakistan's claim. And of course, then Pakistan launched a counter-attack or at least claimed to have uh, launched a counter-attack on Indian military installations in the Punch Rajori region of Jammu and Kashmir, where they dropped some bombs, some ordnance and went back. Of course, Indian uh, Air Force pilot Wing Commander Abhinandan, in his enthusiasm, crossed the LOC uh, to chase the Pakistani F-16s and uh, his MiG-21 was shot down and he was captured. And in two days he was returned because India applied so much pressure on the Pakistani establishment that uh, they were fearful of a retaliatory strike from India uh, through missiles and through unspecified uh, methods uh, which was later debated and revealed in the Pakistani National Assembly or the Parliament. Those issues or those events and those uh, facts are very well known to you. Today uh, what I am trying to do is to understand how 
the two militaries of India and Pakistan have looked at lessons from the Pulwama Balakot uh, attack or Pulwama attack and Balakot strike and what lessons they may have learned and what it holds for the future and what is the uh, assessment in the capitals of other nations like the United States, UK, France, China, uh, all that. So uh, let's look at what happened at uh, that point in time. We all know uh, those events of 26th February and 27th February and there were of course claims of victory as I said uh, and one lesson that Indian military has learned or has imbibed is that there exists a space between a subconventional retaliatory response to a Pakistani terrorist attack uh, and uh, the eventual or the final nuclear uh, conflagration between the two sides who possess nuclear weapons. So uh, limited use of military force can be applied is what India has learnt through the Balakot strike. And uh, any fears that the conflict would lead to further escalation uh, to a conventional uh, uh, conflict or uh, the conflict, conventional conflict getting into a nuclear domain uh, have, been found, uh, have been found to be uh, baseless in a way because Pakistan didn't uh, utter a word about nuclear forces or nuclear weapons that its politicians and some of its uh, generals used to talk about that Pakistan possesses a nuclear weapon and India should not risk any uh, adventure or misadventure as they would call it. But the Balakot strike was uh, definitely a first in many senses. One was that for the first time after 1971, Indian Air Force uh, was used to attack a terrorist camp. And India was very clear that it was attacking a non-military uh, uh, target without uh, harming the civilian population or had no intention to uh, attack a military installation. All that it wanted to do was to send a message to the terrorists and their handlers. So that was uh, what India wanted to say that uh, this is the uh, new uh, paradigm that India is going to adopt compared to what had happened in say uh, 2001 post the parliament attack in December 2001 and post the uh, Mumbai attack in 2008 when India's uh, military response was seen to be non-existent or feeble and uh, that has changed, the mindset has changed. India is willing to use its military for uh, taking on the Pakistanis or sending a message and the fact that Balakot which is uh, beyond Pakistan occupied Kashmir was selected shows that India is not afraid of raising the bar and is aware that Pakistan is in no position to uh, escalate the matter or escalate the situation uh, to turn into a conventional or a nuclear conflict. That was a lesson India learned. Um, this is uh, where the standoff weapons and the precision targeting by the Air Force which has been practiced for years and that capability existed even in 2001 and 2008 but that wasn't used. So the uh, lesson here or the assessment here or the conclusion here is that the uh, difference in uh, those, those decisions in 2001 and 2008 and in 2019 was the political will or the political risk taking ability of Prime Minister Narendra Modi who demonstrated that he is willing to go the distance to secure India's borders or at least send a strong message to uh, Pakistan, its adversary on the west. On the Pakistani side, the uh, retaliatory strike that it spoke about, Operation Swift Retort, uh, was uh, seen as a befitting reply to India's uh, attack on Balakot. And uh, uh, the uh, nuclear domain question was answered by Lieutenant General Khalid Kidwai, who was for a long time a Pakistani nuclear forces expert. He said that uh, Pakistan's declared quid pro quo plus policy on the nuclear weapons uh, has been uh, in operation and it can be uh, used. That Balakot strike uh, was limited in its uh, scope and its target only because Pakistan has the nuclear option and therefore India did not dare to widen the conflict or widen the strike area is what uh, General Kid Kidwai uh, claimed. He says Pakistan's policy of uh, nuclear retaliation is firmly in place and that prevents India or uh, imposes deterrence on Indian thinking uh, is what Pakistani generals are 
claiming and they continue to uh, believe in that illusion is what uh, it comes out uh, from that uh, discussion or that uh, speech uh, General Kidwai gave in London uh, following the Balakot attack at the IISS conference. Uh, what are the lessons uh, which uh, have been learned? Like I said, India has learned this lesson that it can uh, be more precise, it has to have all its elements uh, come together. Uh, maybe the over enthusiasm that was displayed by Wing Commander Abhinandan uh, should be uh, something that uh, they have to take lessons from. And uh, I think the Air Force pilots will have to look at also what happened at the uh, in Jammu and Kashmir where uh, Indian Air Force helicopter was targeted by its own missile, blue on blue, uh, that happened that accident in which Indian Air Force personnel were killed on board that uh, helicopter. So that is a major mistake which will be rectified and lessons learned from there I am sure. But how did the other countries look at it? Other countries looked at it uh, from the point of view of whether there is this danger of uh, nuclear escalation or escalation to a point where nuclear weapons will come into play. Um, I think uh, one thing is very clear that while the United States and other countries did uh, play, sort of uh, come into play and worked the phones uh, after Abhinandan was captured uh, when he uh, parachuted out of the, uh, of the MiG-21 when he, he was shot down, uh, was that uh, US has now limited ability to influence uh, outcomes because uh, it has to have a measure of neutrality which wasn't there as far as India-Pakistan relations are concerned. But the, uh, the administration did work very hard uh, on uh, trying to de-escalate and trying to calm down tensions and uh, both India and Pakistan feel now uh, is what US feels that both India and Pakistan are willing to use military force in a limited manner if there is a grave escalation or grave provocation. However, uh, from an Indian point of view, uh, what US thinks that what India did very well was to control the escalation. Because if you look at the statement uh, that was uh, read out by uh, India's uh, then Foreign Secretary Vijay Gokhale, where he said uh, that uh, India has conducted uh, or carried out a non-military preemptive action, specifically targeting a JEM camp was uh, very deliberate. India wanted to send a message to the Pakistani military that it is not targeting uh, Pakistani military installation. It wanted to tell the Pakistani public that it is not the target of India's military uh, retaliation. But the only uh, point that India wanted to prove was to attack a terrorist camp and which they did. The Pakistan Foreign Office also interestingly noted uh, on 27th February uh, after Operation Swift retort was completed and when Abhinandan was captured that uh, the strikes on or attempted strikes on the Indian military installations were carried out uh, on non-military targets avoiding human loss and collateral damage. Although this is a half lie because they did try to uh, target Indian military installations. Uh, the purpose of the strike the foreign secretary or the foreign office said that time was to demonstrate our right, will and capability of self-defense. We have no intention of escalation but are fully prepared to do so if forced into that paradigm. So clearly there was uh, the uh, Pakistani attempt to uh, bring down the uh, temperatures, bring down the rhetoric and say that we only wanted to demonstrate for possibly domestic consumption that we have the capability of uh, retaliating against India. So uh, the lesson from here is that the bogey of a nuclear uh, conflagration, a nuclear escalation between India and Pakistan, which is a uh, favorite obsession with the Western nations, where they always start, or even Western media, which always starts uh, writing about or uh, mentioning India and Pakistan in the same breath, saying two nuclear armed countries are at each other's throats or are uh, now uh, undergoing a tension which was not seen earlier. That, that kind of language that is used. Perhaps they will have to uh, amend that language going forward. But the fact is, uh, the situation on the line of control, even since 2019, continues to be uh, what it was. No war, no peace situation. And uh, the dangers of escalation or dangers of uh, provocation from the Pakistani side in Jammu and Kashmir after abrogation of Article 370 in uh, August 2019, continues to remain high and India has to be uh, completely vigilant. 
if you want to see how exactly that balakot strike was carried out uh, and uh, how the uh, mirage uh, 2000 planes flew from gwalior uh, went into uh, the airspace over uh, pakistan occupied kashmir and what was the trajectory and what was the route that they followed what happened in between these are the two videos that we had done i had done one myself uh, on the map uh, one month after the attack and there was an explanatory video by uh, a former air marshal sbp sinha uh, talking to me uh, about how these attacks are carried out what are the preparations what are the, what is the technology that is available all that was done since then both india and pakistan have traversed a great distance india in fact has now got new inductions in uh, in the form of the rafal uh, fighter jets and uh, the uh, s400 uh, air defense systems which has come from russia which would have po possibly prevented or given india a lead time in preventing pakistan's retaliatory strike on 27th february 2019 many lessons there but i thought i must flag this 5 years after what had happened in 2019 which Uh, led into the indian election in 2019 and as we uh, now sit in february or march uh, 2024 india is again uh, going to election in a couple of months pakistan already has an, had an election and is of course uh, trying to install a government after all the chaos that it endured over the past one year or so after uh, prime minister imran khan's uh, arrest uh, in 2023 So there we are as far as India and Pakistan are concerned do watch uh, strat news global and of course simply nitin every saturday where we try and analyze sometimes bring you anecdotal uh, sort of glimpse into the past or uh, observing some of the anniversary so this was one part of that mixed into two observing the anniversary of balakot uh, looking at uh, looking backwards and looking forwards both so do keep watching and of course keep sending your feedback until the next time it's goodbye